perfect. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much and thank you for your patience. Um, so, and thank you for having me here. So uh, today I wanted to address some of the key criticisms that we get of our, uh, of our medicine in the media and from various people. Um, I think it's helpful to remember, and I think particularly in Portugal, you're aware of all of the recent successes and advances that we're having in our medicine. So we, our acupuncture in particular is recommending, recommended in an increasing number of medical guidelines all around the world. Its use is expanding and increasing as the public becomes more aware of what it can offer. Um, and sometimes, as we know, as we become more popular and more successful, this brings out uh, a bigger uh, criticism and a bigger um, uh, resistance, almost you know, this sort of yin-yang dichotomy. Uh, and that's what I understand is happening a bit in Portugal, so that you recently had this success where the government now recognizes standards for acupuncture practice and training. And so this has brought um, a lot of extra media attention, both good and bad, um, in response. And so I think what can be helpful and what I want to teach you today is that when we see new uh, headlines and articles uh, about acupuncture that are criticizing acupuncture and we think, oh no, not another one, what are they gonna say now? What I've noticed over the years is that actually the skeptics only make a very small number of arguments and they repeat them and they say them in different ways, but they actually don't really say anything new. And so if we can anticipate and understand what their arguments are, then it helps us to be more confident in how we might respond if we choose to. So hopefully that makes sense. So in understanding some of these uh, dissenting opinions, it's um, helpful to look at uh, the, the immortal world words from Art of War, that if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And I think, and I don't know if it's different where you are, but I think our profession um, often falls into that middle category that we understand our medicine and we understand a lot of the evidence for our medicine, but we don't really understand what the skeptics are saying and where they're coming from and how they're influential. So if, I think if, if we can understand that, then we can make a, a lot more progress. Um, so, you know, who's the enemy then? Is it, uh, these are some of the more well-known vocal famous skeptics in the United States and in the UK. I don't know if they're well-known in Portugal as well, um, but these are people who are often asked for quotes when the media wants to write something about acupuncture. So for example, this is Steven Salzberg, who is, I think he's some sort of geneticist or genetic biologist. And you can see he, uh, he writes that he's fighting pseudoscience. And in this article in Forbes magazine, which is a mainstream non-medical magazine, so it's something that regular people read quite widely. Um, and he writes, I can't go through all 156 bad practices from this um, article he's review reviewing, but one group of procedures stands out as particularly ridiculous. And these are the various forms of acupuncture, all of them ineffective and none of them with even the slightest possibility, but all of them promoted by quacks or acupuncturists. Uh, and then this, uh, this editorial is actually, um, th this is probably one of the, no, I'm actually, I'll go out and say this is the most cited article by skeptics, full stop. Um, and have fun looking out for this when there's a new article because it's often referred to as a scientific study or it's referred to as strong evidence that acupuncture doesn't work. This is actually an opinion piece 
um, written by two staunch skeptics. And in this particular journal, um, I think this was published back in 2013, so it's not even recent. They invited uh, a contribution that was for acupuncture and one against acupuncture. And this gets re referred to all the time by skeptics as proving that acupuncture doesn't work. And so based off of that uh, opinion piece, the authors wrote these blog posts. And so, but Stephen Novella, uh, who's a pretty well-known anti-acupuncture skeptic, who's a neurologist based at Yale University in the United States, is that what David and I have convincingly argued, in my opinion, is that after decades of research and more than 3,000 trials, acupuncture researchers have failed to reject the null hypothesis uh, and that any remaining possible specific effect from acupuncture is so tiny as to be clinically insignificant. In layman's terms, acupuncture does not work for anything. Uh, and then kind of driving off the same, same thing, this is David uh, Kalkoon, uh, who's based in the UK, uh, and he says that acupuncture is an interesting case because it seems to have achieved greater scientific credibility than other forms of alternative medicine. And I think that that's a really important point. Um, acupuncture, compared to complementary and alternative medicine, and also compared to a lot of conventional medicine, has simply more research and more positive and strong research. And this is one of the reasons why we get so much criticism. So I think it's important to remember that and really to take pride in that because that's a little bit inevitable, right? That if we have this medicine that's working well, that has all this evidence, that there's going to be somewhere, someone out there who's not happy about it. So I think our, uh, the criticism that we receive is a direct res result of our success. And again, I think that's exactly what we see in Portugal based on my understanding. Um, and so he concludes this piece by saying, after more than 3,000 trials, there's no need for yet more acupuncture is dead. Uh, so these guys think that they've ended the conversation. And of course, this is happening all over the world, including in Portugal, that acupuncture doesn't work for anything, says scientists, um, which is a recent article. And also in April, finally, acupuncture you know, doesn't work for anything. Uh, and, and I actually, it was interesting trying to find some of these uh, Portuguese headlines and I was looking at some of the Spanish, a lot of Spanish headlines came up as well. And they use the same language, the same exact phrases everywhere. So you can see that they're actually getting their ideas and their story from the same place, um, which was really quite interesting to me. Uh, and so this was a question that I received a couple of months ago. You know, how do you keep yourself motivated and confident in the face of nonstop negativity around acupuncture? Um, they're constantly belittling our profession and it knocks me down time and again. Um, but I think that if, again, if we understand that we will, we will get more criticism and, and it's okay, it's okay. And it's because of the successes that we're having, then it needn't be such a, a, you know, such a, a, a harmful thing for us. So, um, one point that I want to make, and I think it's an important one to understand, is that when we talk about science, there's this assumption, particularly in the mainstream, but also by a lot of us, that science and medical consensus is about proving objective facts and objective truth, that we do a study to find out the truth with a capital T. And... Um, I have come to believe, and I think that there's a lot of evidence for this, and I'm very open to conversation about this, that medical consensus is actually more like a court of law, where you have two groups of intelligent, rational people, and you have one set of evidence, and they're, they are arguing for opposite conclusions based on this evidence. And in, I think it's also helpful to remember, this is more consistent with our, our Taoist roots, right? That the, the relative nature of yin and yang, that there isn't this sort of objective truth, or if there is, it's, it's before we start speaking, before we start analyzing it. And as soon as we start putting our perspective on it, now we've got a piece of it. Um, and so if we, if we believe or think it's a helpful idea that, that medical consensus is more about, about interpreting the evidence, then that actually gives us a lot of power and a lot of flexibility 
due to this improved understanding because it means we don't need to rely on experts to tell us what's going on that we can feel empowered and confident in our own abilities to interpret what we see and to uh, speak to speak to that truth and um, yes so this is this is this so so you know we have these different individuals speaking on this and everyone who's here in the room and online watching um, can be part of that voice that speaks and interprets on the behalf of our medicine and on the behalf of public health, which uh, I personally believe, based on the evidence that I've seen, that if we can better articulate and speak to acupuncture strengths, that, that we can directly improve public health and perhaps save lives. So this is why we want to, to deconstruct these arguments so that we can understand and that we can set the record straight. So based on my reading of various skeptic websites uh, and arguments and reading the newspapers and seeing these things, the, these six arguments are the only ones that I've ever seen made, honestly, in, in thousands and thousands of words of writing, in hundreds of articles. Um, I've not seen any argument that was outside of these and that they're just any arguments I've seen have been more um, variations on this for the most part, maybe there's a couple of more, but so if, I think if we can focus on these and understand them, then, then we'll be able to anticipate objections. So the first one is that acupuncture does not work because there's no such thing as chi or channels. The second is that it's just a placebo. The third argument is that its effect is too small to notice. It's clinically irrelevant. The fourth is that it's dangerous. The fifth is that it's sold as a panacea, that we claim that acupuncture can cure everything. Uh, and the last is that there are so many different styles of acupuncture that we don't even have uh, agreement or consensus within our practice about how to, you know, which points to use and when to do different things. So I wanna go through each of these and see how we might respond. So the first is that acupuncture does not work because there's no such thing as chi and channels. And I currently believe that this is the only real argument under everything. I think that this is why the skeptics are skeptics. I think that the other arguments um, are, are kind of irrelevant and they're just ways that they are trying to convince people that acupuncture is a problem. Um, and so this is on a skeptic website, Science Based Medicine. Acupuncture is based upon the Eastern philosophy of qi, which is the Chinese term for the supposed life force or vital energy that animates all living things. In TCM, qi flows through pathways in the body known as meridians. Illness results from the flow of qi through the meridians being blocked or by yin and yang being out of balance. He goes on to say, acupuncture is the practice of placing thin needles at acupuncture points, which are said to coincide with points at which meridians cross to improve the flow and restore the balance of chi. Now, this is the key part that he writes. There is no more reason to believe in the reality of chi than there is in the four humors or in the effectiveness of acupuncture than the effectiveness of bloodletting. Um, he writes, acupuncture lacks a plausible mechanism. And now this is the subtle point, which I want people to understand. It is misleading to say that such mechanisms, all of the, the mechanisms that we, that research has shown of how acupuncture works with, you know, with fascia and fiber, fibroblasts and the central nervous system and hormones. So we have this fantastic body of knowledge of the mechanisms of how acupuncture needling helps patients. But the skeptics are saying that it's misleading to say that those mechanisms explain acupuncture because acupuncture is the needling of acupuncture points to affect the flow and balance of chi. And that using needles to mechanically produce these effects uh, might be an incidental consequence, but they aren't the real thing. So this is kind of, this is kind of central to everything because I think um, a lot of us are, well, at least I was before I started writing, you know, reading up on this, like how can they sit there and say that acupuncture doesn't work and that it doesn't have biological plausibility because we, we have more information about how acupuncture works than a lot of conventional pharmaceuticals. I mean, they don't know how paracetamol works. They don't know how 
uh, anesthesia works, you know, things that get used all the time. They don't actually know the mechanisms of, and we have a very vast and high quality um, set of literature explaining how acupuncture works. So how can these guys say that it, it doesn't have biological plausibility? And it's because they're using a very narrow definition of acupuncture. And th this is called, in, in skeptic rational speak, this is called argumentum ad dictionarium. And what that means is that they're making the argument for their belief that acupuncture doesn't work by creating a very narrow definition of acupuncture that helps them win that. So if we look at whether or not acupuncture works, the evidence strongly supports that it does. But if we decide that we're going to define acupuncture as manipulating a, an invisible and unmeasurable life force energy, and we've decided that there's no such thing as this magical life force energy, then we can conclude that it doesn't work. And this is, as I say, this is central to their whole issue. <laughs> so it's helpful for us to understand and tease this out because our, because our medical colleagues, most of our medical colleagues and definitely our prospective patients don't care about this. This is not where they're coming from. This is not their perspective. So my, my understanding is that when, acu when, when critics say acupuncture doesn't work, they're saying there's no such thing as chi. And I think, sorry, I just want to pause. Is everyone still with me so far? Just, yes, Mel, I was just turning the, the sound on. You okay. Are, you are Fantastic. Perfect. Please continue. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, the sound came out. I wondered if I was alone or not. Okay, you guys are still with me. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, if, if there's any truth in this idea that this misunderstanding around what chi is, is, is the biggest form, source of uh, criticism to acupuncture's acceptan acceptance, then I think it's worth um asking the question you know does chi really mean energy anyways um, and this is an interesting one so i want to just give a disclosure that i i don't know chinese so i don't read ancient chinese and i so i don't have any direct relationship with the classics but what i do like to do is ask a lot of questions of people who do know Chinese and do know these things. And so one interesting perspective comes from um, an, an American, uh, well, how do I describe him? He's a, a teacher and a practitioner, uh, and I would describe him as an expert. His name is Andrew Nugent Head. He, um, when he was 18 years old, he moved to China for about 20 years, and he studied with a lot of masters who trained before the Cultural Revolution. So he got this training and immersion of what possibly uh, a more pristine version of Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And he makes an excellent case where he looks in a dictionary, in this case is a Chinese English dictionary, uh, and he says that there are eight definitions for acupuncture, sorry, for the eight definitions looking at just the word qi on its own. Um, and these are the definitions. So air or gas, breath, spirit or morale, influence, mana, smell or odors, to be angry, to provoke, and the weather. And, um, and then further he goes on to, to actually read out that if we look at the character chi next to another character, so you can make uh, like a compound word um, with where either chi is the first syllable or the second syllable, there are over 400 definitions uh, if we, you know, looking at those terms and not a single one of them is energy. So this is an interesting point um, because if we look in the dictionary, energy just simply doesn't come up. Uh, and likewise, um, in a modern uh, translation of the Huang Di Nei Jing by Unshul and Tesnao, uh, they write, we may assume that qi, despite its many diverse applications, always referred to a vague concept of finest matter believed to exist in all possible aggregate states, from air and steam, or vapor, to liquid and even solid matter. In the absence of a conceptual English equivalent, uh, and I assume also Portuguese, Qi is one of the very few Chinese terms we have chosen to transliterate rather than to translate. It should be noted that the interpretation of qi as energy 
so widespread in TCM literature today lacks any historical basis. So this is kind of interesting. And, and I think it's something that's probably helpful for us as a community to discuss and to maybe update our ideas on if that's what the historical literature uh, supports. So in that context of, of, the, um, of this concept of chi being so important to how uh, people outside of the profession understand what we do, this is a look at a website in the UK, so the, Nas the NHS National Health Service, and how they're describing acupuncture. So first they write, Western medical acupuncture is the use of acupuncture following uh, a medical diagnosis, and it involves stimulating sensory nerves under the skin. And this results in the body producing pain relieving endorphins, and these naturally released substances um, are responsible for acupuncture's benefit. Then in contrast, they go on to say, on the other hand, traditional acupuncture is based on the belief that an energy or life force flows through the body in channels called meridians. Practitioners who adhere to traditional beliefs about acupuncture believe that when she doesn't flow freely through the body, this can cause illness. They also believe that acupuncture can restore the flow of chi and so restore health. So, I mean, this is really interesting. So on the one hand, we have the skeptics who basically say that acupuncture isn't good for anything. And they more often than not do not make a distinction between medical acupuncture, dry needling or traditional acupuncture. And then here we see a different flavor of skepticism where the first definition of medical acupuncture, hopefully you can see, seems very reasonable and plausible and like a real medical procedure, whereas traditional acupuncture is based on our belief system, on our almost like a religion, uh, and, and that it's all unprovable. So this is um, how important the choice of words and definitions are to our acceptance. Uh, so the second argument is that acupuncture is just a placebo. And I want to point out that when someone says acupuncture is just a placebo, this is an explanation for how acupuncture works, which means that it, they have, they're acknowledging that it is working. Okay. And that's, uh, I think, important to remember because, again, most patients, the public and medical professionals they want things that work. They are most people, skeptics are a very small group of people. Um, the second thing to understand is that when someone says it's just a placebo, they are only looking at sham control data. They are not looking at usual care. And this is important. And um, it, I, I think this, this review that uh, I found recently, um, I think this, it, it's, um, sums this up very nicely. So the articles called Efficacy and Effectiveness Trials have different goals, use different tools, and generate different messages. And they write that the discussion about the optimal design of clinical trials reflects the perspectives of theory-based scientists and practice-based clinicians. And what's nice about this is that it's it's, that's right, you know, you use different tools for different problems and different questions. So the different designs are designed to answer different questions. And what's cool here is that, you know, when we look at effectiveness trials, and that's about the perspectives of practice-based clinicians, and I would also say reality-based patients, they want to know what works best in the real world, right? That's obvious. So it's completely valid for us to be emphasizing, pointing out these uh, trials that compare acupuncture to usual care because that's what most people care about. Um, so that's a quite a nice thing. So, you know, to, make, to give an example of this, and also this is a bit of a, um, to kind of demonstrate the problem with the acupuncture is just a placebo argument, um, using the example of acupuncture versus topiramate for migraines, uh, a Cochrane review found that topiramate was more effective than placebo for, for migraines. So they found that it reduced, um, topiramate reduced the frequency of migraine headache by 1.2 to, uh, headaches per month, and that there were twice as many responders in the topiramate group. Um, but if we look at this trial on acupuncture versus topiramate, 
we see that acupuncture, which is the percentage of responders of the tall gray bars and the pyramid group or the little white bars, that acupuncture was superior to to pyramid. So if to pyramid is better than placebo and acupuncture is superior to, to pyramid, then acupuncture is superior to placebo. And, and that's um, a kind of a straightforward reality-based thing. And when skeptics try to argue against this, they end up making very bizarre uh, claims to, to back up their beliefs. This is uh, just another way of saying this. Um, so, uh, um, uh, the next argument that we see is that its effect is too small to notice. And now we're getting, this is for me like a, a desperate argument because there are so many uh, treatments that are used in clinical practice that have no evidence, and no, no effect size over placebo. So to be arguing against something that is showing that it has a significant effect uh, in high quality trials because it's small is really desperate to me. Uh, and so this argument was coming from the acupuncture trials collaboration, which is a, um, an individual patient meta-analysis. Hopefully most people who are watching this have heard of this, but it included uh, data from nearly 18,000 patients. And it found that, it ha that acupuncture had a significantly, uh, sorry, a statistically significant effect over sham needling. And the skeptics are arguing that um, we are inappropriately leveraging placebo effects to promote a treatment that has no effect size, uh, that is very small, or sorry, that has an effect size that is very small and in my opinion, overlaps with no effect at all. Which of course it, it doesn't because the data shows that it doesn't effect, overlap and it was, it was, uh, it was better than, than sham. Um, and, and he writes, this is again the same um, neurologist that's this uh, skeptic based in Yale, the comparison between true acupuncture and sham acupuncture shows only a small difference, which is likely not clinically significant. So even the skeptics are saying it works, but maybe not very much. Um, and more importantly, the small difference as well within the degree of bias. Um, he goes on to say that these different sources of bias could be producing this result, in other words, this data is insufficient to reject the null hypothesis, even if we don't consider the high implausibility of acupuncture. So we come full circle to that plausibility question, um, which I think is at the center of this criticism. Now, I wanted to take the opportunity to point out that that 2012 um, meta-analysis was actually recently updated as of um, less than a week ago, and they, so they updated, they, they reran the search. So then they were including all of the studies that have been published since their last search. And so now the number of patients is over 20,000 and the strength of the evidence is even stronger. So the effect size um, for acupuncture versus sham is now a clinically significant 0.2 and the effect size of acupuncture versus no acupuncture, which is including usual care and medication is now 0.5, which is a moderate effect size. So pointing out a little bit of the fallacy of saying, well, acupuncture, you know, it, it, has, it works, but it only works a little. Um, you know, this is an article, this is a systematic review looking at the comparison of surgery to sham surgery. So actual surgery. And, and this finds that this review suggests that sham surgery has shown to be just as effective as actual surgery in reducing pain and disability. Uh, put it another way, real surgery does not perform better than sham surgery. So the fact that, you know, it's people actually taking the time to criticize acupuncture, I mean, this is ridiculous. We, anybody who's concerned with public health would surely be focused on surgery, if, you know, if it has a much more invasive and expensive procedure. And the, the skeptics argue, well, if it was just a placebo, if it was just a sugar pill, um, it might be one thing, you know, but it's, it's a placebo, but it's, it's dangerous. And um, I think that that needs to be put into perspective. There is some risk of harm in, in the acupuncture procedure, as we know, um, particularly when practiced by people who are not adequately trained, but the data shows that acupuncture is amongst the safest interventions in modern medicine with the frequency of occurrence of serious adverse events at 11 per 
4.4 million procedures. So, you know, everything's relative. Yes, acupuncture does have a risk, but it is extremely safe. And of course, it's extremely safe compared to conventional medicine. So in the United States, uh, according to this review in the BMJ, medical error is the third leading cause of death, which is absolutely mental. So after heart disease and cancer, medical error kills more people than car accidents and, and gun you know, gunshots and i'll also point out that these this data is on medical error it's not even including all the people who die from conventional medicine that's practiced appropriately <laughs> so you know in terms of uh, saying that it's dangerous i think we need to again be comparative in our approach um and then Another argument, which I, I think that this is actually a reasonable thing for skeptics um, and people who don't know about acupuncture to flag, that we, we, it's sold as a panacea, you know, that we say that acupuncture can help anything from, you know, depression and anxiety, fertility issues, musculoskeletal and pain, stroke rehab, it's this huge list of very different conditions. And so putting ourselves in the shoes of someone who's not studied acupuncture, or maybe thinking back to before we trained, this is a reasonable thought. How is that even possible for something to help so many things? But I came across a model, and I guess this is, well, it's, it's not a widely used term, but in the research literature, there's a conventional um, concept called hormesis. Uh, I don't know what the word is in Portuguese, but I imagine it would be something similar because it's a Latin root. And it simply refers, um, well, it, the, first it refers to the saying, the dose makes the poison, right? We know, we know that saying. So, you know, water is healthy, but you can actually drink so much water that you kill yourself. Um, so it's talking about that biphasic response where a small stimulus could be helpful, even if a large one could be um, harmful, but also that um, we are designed to respond and adapt to our environment, and those are stressors. So the most obvious example of a hormetic stressor is exercise, right? So we maybe we run or we lift weights, and that produces a stress response that then causes the body to adapt in a healthy way. So we become healthier from this stressor. Uh, also fasting, right? So we know that if we eat fewer calories or if we do intermittent fasting, that that turns on positive changes, even if we, if we always fast, that that's called starvation and that's not helpful. So there's some example, there's some evidence that acupuncture works like this, that this is a small stimulus uh, that if it were, you know, if it were bigger or more, um, dramatic, it would be harmful, but as this tiny stimulus, it, help, it, it triggers a positive self-regulation in the body. Uh, and then the, the last criticism that I see that I wanted to draw attention to is this idea that, and this is, you know, I think this is a real challenge for our profession at the moment, which is that there are so many different styles of what we do, um, and there's so many different ways of practicing that a patient could go, you know, present and say, right, I want some acupuncture, and could go to five different practitioners and receive five different diagnoses and get five different treatments. Um, and this is a bit challenging to explain to people from outside of our profession. Um, and so I actually, I actually agree with this crit criticism somewhat. So um, I came across this idea in a book called Human Givens uh, by two British psychiatrists. And this is not about acupuncture, this is about therapy. So like psychotherapy and talking ther therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. They write, it has been estimated that there are at least 400 different therapy models on offer throughout the world, which in itself indicates the general lack of shared perceptions about how best to help people. In other words, psychiatry and psychotherapy are still at a primitive level of development. And I actually think that in some ways that does apply to us. So I think that there's, there's certainly room for diverse styles of practice and for different people to have different ways. But I also believe that we should have some shared perceptions as well. And that there's, I think there's a high likelihood that some of the styles that are in practice 
have kind of, maybe we don't know where they came from. Maybe they came from one individual and maybe there isn't really good rationale and that maybe some of the other practices are stronger. So I think as we continue, you know, this, this sort of pivotal time in the profession's develop, development as we get increased support for what we do and also have others from outside wanting to use our medicine, that if we can um, be, gather more shared perceptions of what's going on with our patients and how best to use this medicine to help patients, that I think that would be a positive development. Um, so that's something I think for us to consider. So the, the kind of parting thought that I want to leave you with then uh, to make this practical is that it's my impression that all skeptical arguments are at their root about the existence of chi and theoretical doubts. So not that acupuncture doesn't work, but that they believe it shouldn't in theory work. And so whoever you're speaking with, if you bring the conversation back to the actual clinical evidence, you will win allies because that is what people care about. So um, I hope that that was helpful and clear and that I kept uh, the, <laughs> the speed uh, understandable. And, um, and thank you very much for your time and attention. So you can, um, I don't know, if you want to let me know if there's any questions, I've got some time for questions or comments. I see Gil. <laughs> yeah. um, I've come live now. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't Hopefully we're still connected with Portugal. Yeah. Hello. Hopefully. <laughs> I heard you, so you were not talking to Good. Well, if, no even, if just, <laughs> even if just you heard me, then that's something. <laughs> yeah. Do you have the, by the way, the PDF of the medical error? Yes. Do you mind sharing? I'm always happy to share. I'll make a note. Good. <laughs> I had it, I had the numbers, but I like the figure that you showed. Um, yeah, that's a good one. And actually I found yeah, it, um, The numbers I remember, I remember it's a third leading, um, it was published two, three years ago, two years yeah. ago. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I didn't have the, the PDF, I didn't care about it. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a, like a beautiful figure. It's a nice visual, <laughs> yes. And I found some more recent things as well. Uh, not. Not on medical, oh yeah, medical reversals, on the reversals of the evidence. Uh, mm. so, yeah, that okay. was quite interesting as well. <laughs> okay. Is everyone on, is someone online? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> well, I heard your point of view on... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a nice time for us to catch up and for me to present yeah. my perspective on that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, we also had uh, an issue with the computer, but fortunately now it's working and we were able to, to hear everything that you said. It was a brilliant presentation and uh, some of us have some questions. We are going to try to um, pass the, the microphone, so just please let us try to do it. Uh, um, can Hello, Mel. Hi. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was really. My question is about um, insisting or not in including placebo in our research, in our scientific research. Because so, it's, it's not useful to include placebo trials in acupuncture. 
I think it's ridiculous. There is no placebo. As well, you can't on um, physical therapy you have uh, you simulate ice in every bodily intervention, including uh, surgery. There is no um, intervention that you could say uh, that there is no effect. So I think that we should go away from from placebo because if if we can account for all non-specific effects of acupuncture, then we, we can say that we can uh, obtain or not placebo. So if we don't know all the non-specific effects of acupuncture, I think it's a scientifically, scientifically non-logical to use placebo in acupuncture as a control. Thank you. Um. Yes, so this is a this is a good point, and, and uh, your perspective is shared by quite a few people. I think it can, if it's helpful, to just give a little bit of background. Um, and you might already know this, but we we got into this uh, trap, if you like, um, of of having sham controlled trials because we were trying to base our studies off of the metaphor of pharmaceuticals, and so. It, our desire to have this mainstream acceptance meant that we were uh, pretending that we could study acupuncture in that way. And that's caused us a bit of a problem, partly by not defining sham very well and not defining placebo and also by not defining acupuncture. Now, um, I'll kind of, I'll echo what I said earlier about different, um, you know, study designs are not good or bad. They're, they're just appropriate or inappropriate for particular questions. The, the problem that we have if we completely stop sham controlled trials is that we have very little way of defending ourselves against people who say, yeah, it works, but it doesn't matter where you stick the needles. And so um, I think most people feel that what we do is, you know, as traditional Chinese medically trained acupuncturists who trained for three or four years, we feel that there's a difference between what we do and what physio dry needling does or what uh, medical doctors do after shorter training. But if you know, the, the either sham controlled or head to head trial is, is, is what you would need to show that. So um, we're in a little bit of a dilemma, but I agree with you that I think even though sham controlled trials it made sense at the time because we're now in 2018 and now we have over 10,000 randomized controlled trials. But remember um, 20 years ago when acupuncture was first being introduced, you know, accepted in the West, we didn't have that. So I think the sham controlled trials were a necessary step. The biggest problem has been misinterpretation. I don't know if that if that makes sense. <coughs> so that thank you, uh, but that sorry that falls with another question. Do we really really need to worry about proving to other to the scientific community that acupuncture works, or should we? commit our time and effort to use scientific methods to improve our, our clinical uh, so mm. yeah that's an, that's an excellent question um, <laughs> I think I think we need to do both but I think we have been doing the, the latter so I think oh sorry I can't remember what order you just said. I think we've spent, we've spent most of our time trying to convince the conventional mainstream that acupuncture works. And so we've been doing these trials, but actually I think, I agree. I think what now where our, our research dollars uh, would be better spent is on um, defining what constitutes excellent acupuncture and really understanding what it is that we do. So one example of this is on the issue of dosing. So if you look at a systematic review of acupuncture, um, let's say a Cochrane review, there's going to be a huge range of things as simple as how many treatments they got. And in the most recent Cochrane review for acupuncture for migraine prevention, 
there was a clear delineation in the effect size that if patients received at least two treatments a week for six weeks, so 12 treatments over six weeks, they had a markedly better effect size than those who received less. And so that's a, something as simple, without even getting into theory and channels and point selection, um, something that differentiated it versus sham. Um, so I think that if we can move into this era of, of getting like really excellent at acupuncture, then we'll get better results and, and patients will vote with their feet. And I think also it just will make us better practitioners. So I think, um, I think that that would be a very positive direction. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we got this job. No. Okay, Mel. So, Mel, thank you very much. We are really, really pleased for your time. It was a brilliant presentation. And uh, hopefully, in the future, we may continue to cooperate with you. You guys have done, have been doing a wonderful job. Congratulations and thank you very much for all the work. Thank you.